go here to the board and review a couple things, Gannon. Um, so we've got a couple drugs up on the board here, aspirin and meth, okay? Meth is highly abused, right? But it is in some prescription medications. It's a very effective stimulant and, and vasodilator, bronchial dilator. It's used for a number of applications as long as it's used properly. It's not an over-the-counter drug. It's prescription only, but it is abused uh, by, by different people. But aspirin, uh, we can look at the functional groups here, and that's kind of the topic of Chapter 3. But here we're talking about acid-base stuff. At pH 7, what is the structure of aspirin? Is it charged or still neutral? I'm drawing the neutral form here, which is a carboxylic acid. And what's this functional group up here? Let's see how many people read ahead. There's actually three functional groups in aspirin. Let's see. We know this one, carboxylic acid. What's this one up here? What's that? Ester. Yeah, ester. And how about this one over here? Benzene or aromatic or arene? We'll, we'll take any answer for that. But if it's a, a ring of pi bonds, it's, it's aromatic there. And so uh, pH 7. Let's see, do we know the pKa of any of these functional groups? Yeah, five for the carboxylic acid. So if we put it in a solution at seven, are we on the basic or the acidic side of this pKa of five? We're on the what? The basic side, right? So what? Aspirin in neutral water is going to look like this. <laughs> okay. It's going to have the ester still there, but the carboxylate now is formed, the conjugate base there, because at pH 7, there's enough hydroxide to pull this proton off. It's acidic enough. Yeah, it's a weak acid, but it can't ionize. Oh, well, who cares about this? <laughs> is this just another little idea we want to torment you with to keep track of? Might this have something to do with the action of that drug? Aspirin's used to, to treat what? Pain and inflammation, fever. So it's got a number of applications. It's a cheap drug. It's very effective. It doesn't work for really chronic or severe conditions, but for 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 uh, routine things, it works very well. Um, so let's see. In the stomach, if you take this drug orally, <laughs> the pill, what's the pH of stomach conditions? Let's see. And you ingest any. It kind of depends on when you've eaten, right? But uh, anybody know the pH inside of the stomach? Yeah. One or two, yeah, depending on what you've eaten. And that's super acidic, right? And that's to help digest the food, to break down the proteins of the food mainly. But if it's a pH one or two here, uh, it's going to be protonated, right? That's on the acidic side. So it will be neutral. And that's actually beneficial for the transport of the drug through the linings, the, the cells that make up the lining of the stomach that absorb that material, okay? So to get through the lipid bilayer membrane, we'll talk about that also in Chapter 3, to get transported through there, it's better to be neutral and less polar. But once it gets into the bloodstream and other, you know, uh, other positions in the body, uh, it becomes what? Neutralized, the aqueous solutions. And then it becomes carboxylate, so it becomes more water-soluble, which helps it persist longer in certain parts of the body, okay? But the initial absorption is actually aided by it being neutral, okay? Now, don't worry about all that. That's kind of application stuff. But you can kind of begin to see why these concepts might be important. It has to do with the pharmacokinetics of drugs, the metabolism of drugs, uh, and how they're transported to the body. How about meth here? Here we have an amine with a pair of electrons right there. We put that in pH 7, what's it going to do? Is it going to stay neutral like this? Or do we know the pKa of its conjugate acid here, which would look like this? All right, with two hydrogens on there. Now it's got a plus charge, right? And we know what the pKa of that ammonium group is. What is it? It's 9, right? And so if we're at pH 7, are we on the acidic or the basic side of that 9? We're on the acidic side, right? So it's going to stay protonated. <laughs> so meth, if you take it orally, will be protonated in the stomach, okay? That will make it harder to be absorbed 
Okay, it'll it'll take a little bit longer to get into the bloodstream and start to do its thing. But if it's neutral here, if it's the free base meth, you've probably heard of free base cocaine, right? Another highly abused drug. That's more volatile. It's neutral. It's not uh, charged. And so you can uh, take that a number of different ways here. But there's the salt form of amine drugs, okay, which are ionic. And there's the free base forms, and they have different properties in the body and different properties of how they can be uh, taken there. All right, speaking of functional groups, FGs, and we've got to learn 16 of them here in Chapter 3. <laughs> I've already been mentioning a lot of them, but let's see how many you know here. Yeah, first a question. Uh-huh. Right, question on the quiz. We had a molecule with a bunch of different functional groups and some of them didn't have a clear pKa value. You're kind of guessing about some. I gave you a hint on the amide one. I told you the amide is not basic, so you didn't need to worry about that one being protonated. And I told you the thiol. The thiol had a pKa of, of 10. We gave you the, th the pKa of phenol, which is also 10. And then ammonium, cation, is, is one you need to know. And that one was drawn in neutral form on the quiz, just like meth here. It's a secondary amine. But you need to recognize if you put it in aqueous solution where you have the availability of, of acid or base, whatever, you need to know that that ammonium cation with a pK of 9 means that anything on the acidic side of it is going to be protonated. Okay. So I want you to kind of apply the principles. I don't want to give you a big chart of PKAs. <laughs> there is that chart in Chapter 2. Any other ones, I would give you the PKA values and help you figure it out. Does that answer your question? <laughs> Maybe you felt like you didn't have all of them. You can also look them up. There's all sorts of uh, charts online <laughs> in different places. So uh, as you're studying, you can keep track of them that way. But yeah, we'll try to keep you informed there. All right, let's see how many functional groups we just know off the top of our head already. Okay. How about this molecule? Hexane. We've already mentioned hexane. Does that have a functional group? And what is a functional group? We need a good working definite definition for that, don't we? Functional group. The function of the molecules affected by a functional group. Who's got a good definition for functional group? Well, one's up there already, right? <laughs> Reactive subunit of a molecule. Yeah, that's the one out of your book. I like conservative, conserve substructure of a molecule. That's a little bit better. And what do you mean by conserved? Well, it's the same in a bunch of different types of molecules. Uh, and it's a substructure. It's not the whole structure of the molecule, but it affects its properties and reactivity. So that's why we can focus on these functional groups. There are millions of organic compounds. We can't memorize all of them. But if we know the substructures and how those substructures work, we've got a real leg up on figuring it out. Is there a functional group here in hexane? <laughs> that's kind of a tricky question, yes. Alkane, yes, in the alkane class, it's in the broader hydrocarbon class of molecules, but it just has CH bonds. And, you know, we don't normally think of those as reactive. Well, we'll see in Chapter 15 we can actually react alkane CH bonds. <laughs> but usually alkanes are the typical frameworks of a molecule, the skeleton, the, the chains and rings, whatever. Okay. So your book says that's not really a reactive functional group, but it is coming up. Okay. <laughs> But yeah, alkanes, just CH. How about this one? What functional group is that? Alcohol, very good, okay. So yeah, we got a hydrocarbon framework here with four carbons, but then we have the OH group, which is a water-like molecule. Yeah, very polar, and we'll need to, to look at that. It's because oxygen has, so what, six valence electrons can form two covalent bonds. So we'll relate back all the functional groups to Lewis dot theory. So this is a good way to review your Lewis dot structures. Make sure you know where all the electrons are and what the bonds mean. But an OH or a hydroxyl group is the key thing in alcohols. Okay. What about that one? That's one maybe we haven't talked about. Let's see if anybody read chapter three. <laughs> I always like to gauge this a little bit. Yes. 
Esther, yes, an Old Testament molecule, right? <laughs> so here's Queen Esther, and uh, it's got a carbonyl and then uh, an OH group here. Kind of looks like an ether. We'll look at ethers later. But with the carbonyl and the alkoxy group, that's an ester. Okay. Those are great molecules, tend to be uh, very pleasant smelling, produced by a lot of plants and flowers, <laughs> essential oils, whatever. <laughs> very pleasant smelling, where carboxylic acids are some of the nastiest smelling things you can uh, get a hold of. But if you convert a carboxylic acid into an ester, you've got a whole new world there. Speaking of uh, bad odors, what about this functional group? Thiol. Yeah, we saw that on, on uh, quiz two. This is the essence of skunk, so you can't come up with a worse smelling compound than that. Uh, it's analogous to alcohols, right? Sulfur's right below oxygen in the periodic table, six valence electrons, but this SH group has very different properties than the OH. Okay, alcohols don't have that nasty smell. So let's look at the outline. Let's go up here, Gannon, and uh, see what we're looking at. Uh, go through this. So. My outlines, again, Try to I try to put all the information you need to know there. Functional group, yeah, reactive subunit of a molecule, and they're, you know, focusing on the reactivity. I like the conserved substructure definition, but whatever you need to come up with, right? I think you got a feel for that. But it's responsible for the properties, the polarity, and the reactivity. Okay, it's appended onto the hydrocarbon framework. And that was the first day question, why carbon, right? So carbon, we kind of got to some of the issues there, but not everything. Why is carbon the ideal framework forming long chains and rings? And it kind of begs the question, why don't the other atoms right near carbon do the same thing, okay? We could have chains of oxygen or boron and rings, but would they be the same stability and stay in same uh same type of framework there, reactivity-wise? No, you might want to think about the differences there. So here they are. Sorry, there's 16 of them that you need to know. <laughs> and I'll go through them sequentially today, of course. Um, 16 of them. That's not all of them. There's actually hundreds of functional groups. Some are quite complex and exotic and less common. These are the very common, useful ones that we'll need to know. Uh, they're in three broad categories. The hydrocarbon one, we already saw on the alkanes. Heteroatom one, where you have a Z group that's not carbon, something else, heteroatom, usually oxygen, nitrogen, sulfur, phosphorus, boron, whatever. So we saw alcohol, ester, uh, ether there. No, we didn't. No, ester's down here in the carbonyl group. <laughs> yeah, carbonyls. Carbon-oxygen double bond species, there's a lot of those. In fact, carbonyl is really a substructure of a substructure. There's a lot of functional groups that have a carbon-oxygen double bond. It's called a carbonyl. And we got aldehydes, ketones, carboxylic acids have the carbon-oxygen double bond. Uh, ester, amide, acid chloride. Those are the ones we'll have you know. And you just need to know the broad general uh, identification of it, not the specific naming of a specific one yet. In later chapters, we'll have you do the specific naming. Okay. Uh, but, but here you're just identifying those functional groups. We will get into the properties. Intermolecular forces, electrostatic, for salts, covalent that are uh, nonpolar, or van der Waals, dispersion forces, they're very weak. If it's a permanent dipole in the molecule, dipole-dipole uh, interactions are stronger. I'll give you the relative energies of those, how they relate to other energies, stabilities you might be familiar with. And then hydrogen bonding, which is just a special case of dipole-dipole interaction, where you have a small polarizable hydrogen on a what, oxygen or nitrogen. That just accentuates that small dipole, and it can easily get close to another molecule that has a lone pair uh, and can uh, can do hydrogen bonding. And those forces are stronger generally than dipole-dipole. Properties, we'll look at boiling point, melting point, solubility, hydrophobic effects, some simple things there. I already mentioned some of these drugs, right? Vitamins, you're probably familiar with these. They're in two categories, fat-soluble or nonpolar vitamins and water-soluble vitamins, okay? You've probably heard about some of these. But you need to examine the structure and come up with a rationale for why they're either fat-soluble, nonpolar overall, or why they're polar, okay? So just inspecting the properties in the structure. Ah, the cleaning action of soap. What's, what's not to like there, right? Um, 
fatty acid salts. They're amphoteric. They can form micelles and pull off stains and grease off different surfaces. Surfactant materials. Membranes, we just mentioned cell membranes, uh, the transport of drugs through the membranes. Well, there's the interior of the lipid bilayer membrane that's nonpolar. So that's a barrier to getting things from one aqueous solution, say on the exterior of a cell, into the aqueous interior, the cytosol of a cell. So yeah, we'll combine a little bit of biology here to talk about that. Uh, and reactivity, so that's, that's the term up here, right? Reactive subunit. I'll show you how the reactions work there. If they're heteroatom type functional groups, the carbon's electron deficient. It's a very polar covalent bond, and generally that's where the carbon will react with nucleophiles, electron-rich reagents. If it's just an alkene or an alkyne, that's a position of uh, high electron density. Those groups can react with electrophiles. You can pull those pi electrons out, okay? So that reactivity will allow to do that. And we'll look at biomolecules as we've seen before. All right, let's go through the categories here uh, on the overhead first. This is graphics from your book, of course. Then I'll go to the board and summarize some of the specifics of different ones. Uh, so what do we got here? The four hydrocarbon classes. Hydrocarbon, what does that imply? Hydrogen and carbon only, okay? Uh, these tend to be the framework functional groups. Alkane, like ethane, for example. So ethane's a specific name. You don't need to know how to name those yet. That's coming up in chapter four. <laughs> You just need to know that alkanes are all sp3 hybridized, saturated hydrocarbon, the maximum amount of hydrogens present there. No double bonds, no triple bonds, no rings uh, with, with pi bonds there. You can have rings as long as they're saturated, okay? But right now it's just alkanes right there, okay? Is it a function group? Your book says no. I say yes because of chapter 15 coming up. <laughs> we know how to functionalize a lot of carbon-hydrogen bonds now quite selectively. There's a number of new catalysts that do that. In the old days, we called those alkanes inert, no reactivity, okay? Certainly not the same type of reactivity as alkenes with a double bond or alkynes with a triple bond, okay? So these are alkenes. Uh, notice the, the general name E-N-E. -E. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about, you know, specific naming later, but A-N-E implies saturated sp3 bonding. Alkene implies at least one double bond. And as long as there's one double bond, it is an alkene. Alkyne triple bond and then arene or aromatic compound. And uh, benzene can have different functionality on it. Uh, it becomes a phenyl group if that's part of the prefix name. And you heard that term phenol already. That kind of combines two ideas, right? The phenyl group and alcohol, phenol. Okay, a lot of specific names will have uh, kind of a hybrid, kind of a put together of, of two specific names. Questions on the hydrocarbons? Okay, should be pretty clear. Okay, here's the uh, Z ones or the heteroatom ones. And we can have carbon substituted with a halogen. So here's uh, methyl bromide. And uh, the halogens are along the uh, the right side of the periodic table, right next to the noble gases, right? Fluorine on down to iodine. They're uh, monovalent. They have seven valence electrons. And there they are. That seventh one is now in a bond to carbon. And what's up with this R group here? So we see a lot of this R group designation. Anybody bothered by that? Why R? And what's the R representing? Well, that's the hydrocarbon framework, either the chain or the ring. Where does the R come from? From the German word radical. And we're not talking about uh, politics there. <laughs> we're talking about the radical, the subunit of the hydrocarbon framework. So it kind of persists. The Germans were, were keys in developing uh, organic theory and structure stuff. So the R group persists. It's a radical. If you homolize that bond, you literally create a free radical that we'll see later in chapter 15. But don't worry about it now. R just just uh, summarizes the chain or the ring it might be on, that functional group. And that can vary, right? That radical group can, can vary there. Alcohol, same thing. OH group, there it is. Um, I already talked about the Lewis dot thing. Ether, there's a great one. It's oxygen, but with two carbons now on it, instead of one carbon and an H, right? So they're similar that way, 
but but different. And they all have different properties, okay? Ethers. Probably heard of diethyl ether, the original anesthetic reagent used in operating rooms to knock out patients, revolutionized surgery. I already talked about one surgery molecule, didn't I? Oh, phenol, the antiseptic thing for surgery. <laughs> This is to knock people out for anesthesia, diethyl ether. This is dimethyl ether right now, but, but there it is right there, okay? And we're also implying something about the geometry here now, right? We've got the bent structure like water and bent structure here in ether, okay? So you can kind of review that too. Amines, we've been talking about amines. We have methamphetamine up there. Uh, an amine has an amino group. It's just substituted ammonia where you take off one or more of the hydrogens and put on carbons, okay? So you can have an amine there. Trigonal planar, trigonal pyramidal, if you look at geometry, uh, uh, tetrahedral, if you look at the electron configuration, right? We count that lone pair as a group there. This is the neutral form, what, at high pH. <laughs> so that'll be an ionizing one. Then we got thiol, there it is, bent like water, okay, SH. And sulfide, which is the uh, ether, analogous ether compound, but now with a sulfur in there, okay? These are longer bonds. It's a third row element. It has different properties. Lower electronegativity than oxygen, so it changes the properties somewhat. Okay, those are the uh, Z ones. I think uh, that's all of them there. And now the carbonyl ones. Carbonyl refers to a carbon-oxygen double bond. The simplest unit would be carbon monoxide, okay? That's a gas molecule, it's toxic, we, we're not talking about that. We're talking about a carbonyl within the structure of our organic molecule. So here's aldehydes, a carbonyl with at least one hydrogen on the side, okay? If you have a carbonyl with a hydrogen on the side, that's called an aldehyde. This is acid aldehyde right here. And you see the structure, carbon oxygen double bond. You see the trigonal planar geometry around that functional group, right? So all these things carry over from Vesper theory and hybridization we're talking about. What's the hybridization of this carbon here in an aldehyde? SP3, SP2, or SP? Who can help us out here? What's the hybridization of the carbon? Yes. SP2, very good. So that pi bond is made up from the P atomic orbital left by to, to form the pi bond, right? So you can see that structural uh, idea there. If you have two carbons on the side of a carbonyl here, that's a ketone. Here's acetone. Uh, you see the same overall type geometry there, but more sterically hindered. You've got two alkyl groups here, whereas an aldehyde, you just have one little hydrogen. Then we got our old friend, carboxylic acid. That's the one we've probably been talking about the most, right? <laughs> With acetic acid. <laughs> And uh, pKa value of 5, right? Uh, and there it is, you know, it's got the carbonyl. It's got an OH there. But, yeah, that OH is not an alcohol now. That has a much lower pKa due to resonance, right? So much more uh, uh, strong as an acid there and different properties. And like I said, they smell really bad, okay? Vinegar is very pungent. And if you get up to uh, butanoic acid with three hydrocarbon carbons here, that's body odor, right? And uh, the longer chain ones don't smell any better. <laughs> they get worse, okay? <laughs> so, yeah, free carboxylic acids are kind of nasty there. But when you form the esters, you're pleasant smelling and fruity, okay? <laughs> I'll show you some examples of that. And, and an ester doesn't have the OH group on the side. It has an alkoxy group. O with a carbon. So here's one with methoxy. So this is a methyl ester. This is called methyl acetate. And that specific name you don't need to know, but you need to be able to identify an ester from an aldehyde, from an ether or whatever right now. Okay. That's the main thing. And then relate it to Lewis dot and geometry and all that. So it's a good review for that. And then amide, we've been talking about amides. Uh, it's an amine, you could say. That doesn't act like an amine now. It's not basic anymore. It's very hard to protonate that lone pair on an amide. Why? And that was the hint on quiz two, right? Why are amides not basic now? Why are they hard to protonate? What do you see structurally about an amide? You see the lone pair, what, conjugated to the carbonyl. So that lone pair is delocalized into the carbonyl. So it's a lot less basic. 
You can protonate an amide with a super strong acid like HCl or sulfuric acid. And then the pKa, the protonated amide, is about minus one. It's a very strong acid. It wants to get that proton off to go back to resonance stabilization. Okay. We'll look at that later. But you need to recognize an amide as a carbonyl with an amine on the side. Okay, that whole group together is called an amide. It's not an amine. It's not a ketone. Ketone is two carbons on the side. If you have this amino group and a carbonyl here, those two sub-sub structures, this whole thing together is a subunit called, what, an amide. Or if you're British, an amide. There probably aren't any British people here, though. Amide, amide, okay. <laughs> The American version, sorry. Okay, acid chloride is carbonyl with a uh, chlorine there. That's the most common uh, halo acids here. You, you also have acyl uh, bromides and fluorides. We'll see acid chlorides later on as a very important reactive group uh, later on. And there you see the halogen on the side. We don't call these halide functional groups. These are acid halides, okay? It comes from a carboxylic acid. Uh, it's not an acid actually anymore. It's an acyl halide, okay? So an acyl group with a chloride there is the acid chloride group. Very reactive, okay? So those are the carbonyl compounds. Let's count them up. How many did we have here? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ouch. How many? 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. Can you keep track of those, okay? The names have importance. We'll use those terms over and over again. This is the language of organic chemistry. It carries over into biochemistry and a lot of other functional groups. Let's see if we can carry this over. We already talked about aspirin. Uh, what are the functional groups in aspirin there? You can see them. Let's review them. How many do you see in aspirin? Yes, please. So what's this one up here? That's a ester. And what's this one down here? Carboxylic acid. And is there one more here? Yeah, benzene or arene. Okay. Pretty simple drug. And uh, these are the older drugs up here at the top. Penicillin, you probably heard about. Morphine even or cocaine. Methamphetamine, we just had it more. Let's get into some more complex molecules. Oh, the newer anti-cancer Compound Taxol and FK506, the immunosuppressant drug used for organ transplants. Let's look at FK506 here, Tacrolimus. What functional groups do you see here? Do you see a ketone in FK506? Yeah, right here is a ketone. Is there another ketone here? Yeah, right here. What about that carbonyl? Is that carbonyl a ketone? Hopefully you can see my cursor okay there. Can't see my laser pointer anymore. They told me I got to go to the onboard cursor. But that carbonyl right there, is that a ketone or another functional group? Yeah, who has an idea there? What would we call that? Yes. Yes, it's an amide. Very good. Because you see the amine right next door there. Okay. And that lone pair is conjugated to that right there. So that's indeed an amide right there. You see a bunch of ethers. There's methyl ethers here and here. You see an alcohol right there and there, another methyl ether there, an alkene right there, an alcohol right there. Yeah, I think that's it. Uh, Taxol, the anti-cancer uh, drug here. Let's see if we can find a uh, an ester. In fact, I think there's a lot of esters here in Taxol. Here's an ester right here. Here's an ester down here. Here's a benzoate ester down here with a benzene ring on it also. Is there another ester? Oh, right there, putting the side chain on. How about this one? Is this an ester here? No, that's also uh, amide, okay? So you can look through these functional groups and see what's going on. Some of them we haven't covered uh, right here. We have an amide right there, but this sulfur group right here, <laughs> uh, the sulfur carbon double bond, we haven't covered those. And with two uh, things there, two nitrogens, that's a thiourea group. <laughs> so there's a lot of other groups. And what about this carbon-nitrogen group here? That's a nitrile or a cyanide. We haven't covered those yet either. We'll, we'll maybe see those later. We have an aromatic halogen right here. So that's kind of a combination of groups here. We have the benzene with the halide. 
Okay, so you could call that a, a halo, halogen, but it's on a benzene ring, okay? So it's an aromatic uh, one there. But yeah, any others there you wanna look at? No, okay. Before we do uh, forces, let's go through some of the structures a little bit more. And I like to show the reactivity of uh, functional groups. So ethane, for example, uh, you know, it's, it's a gas at room temperature, has a boiling point of minus 98 degrees C. So yeah, it's a component in natural gas. You burn it in your furnace or in the, uh, on the stove, whatever. Uh, it's a hydrocarbon, right? C2H6, just one line, but add in the two methyl groups here, CH3s, right? Very different molecule if you make ethanol or grain alcohol, it has a boiling point of what? 78 degrees C. <laughs> wow, much, much higher. So this is a gas at room temperature, right? This is a liquid, okay? What about reactivity? If we react an alkane with acid or base, we get no reaction. We have to react it under vigorous conditions, free radical conditions to halogenate it. And the alkanes will see reactivity later on. But if we react an alcohol with acid or base, sulfuric acid, is that a strong enough acid to protonate a lone pair here? Yes, it is. We can create the hydronium ion of alcohols. And then some other reactions can occur here because we've got lone pairs there on oxygen, right? The pKa of a hydronium ion is about minus two, okay? So you need a super strong acid in order to do that, okay? But you can, you can protonate that, okay? Not under typical uh, aqueous conditions. The pH range from zero to 14, notice this pKa is below that. So you need to have stronger than one molar conditions with strong acid. That's what that means. Can you go to the negative range of the pH scale? Yeah, you can. But then water takes on some different properties and certain biological tissues will fly apart under those strong acidic conditions. But certain functional groups can react there. What about with base? Let's react it with sodium hydride. Uh, there's our base, right? And let's see if we do the conjugate base of our acid, the alcohol, yeah, that can form. And what? Hydrogen uh, is our conjugate acid in that case. And the pKa of this is 35. Uh, yeah. So that's certainly strong enough. The pKa of this is 16. So yeah, we can react alcohols with strong bases and get alkoxides. And then we can do other reactions from there. But these reactions are not available to alkanes. Okay. And what about this difference in the properties? The super low boiling point, it's a gas, or a super high boiling point, right? Uh, which is kind of cool, I think, to think about. Anyway, uh, the different functional groups, the alkanes. Let's just jump ahead to uh, arenes. This is a cool one. This molecule. Maybe we saw this the first day of class. I had a bunch of graphics showing you a bunch of different molecules. So here's a methyl. Well, let, let, let's see. How many functional groups can we identify in this molecule? This is vanillin. This is the essence of vanilla produced by a number of plants, the vanilla tree, for example. Or you can make it synthetically, and it smells and tastes just like vanillin out of the plant. Okay. We know how to make a lot of naturally occurring materials. Where are the functional groups here? Which ones can you identify? Who can see one and tell us real quick? You see a functional group? Yes, please. Aldehyde, very good. <laughs> okay, yes, it is a, an aldehyde vanillin. Okay, are there other functional groups? It's a combination, yeah. Benzene with the alcohol, we could call that phenol. If you want to use that term, you're okay. Or if you call it alcohol and then call this what, an arene or an aromatic. So that's a kind of hybrid term that covers both of them. So we're up to what, three? Is there one more functional group here? What do we call this one on the side here? Has a methyl CH3, that's what ME stands for. <laughs> we'll review that in chapter four coming up actually. What is it then? Ether, very good. It's an oxygen with two carbons on it. So it's indeed an ether. 
And it's the combination of these groups and that structure that gives vanillin its properties. And we won't go on the olfactory effect and how it hits the receptor in your nose, whatever. But it's the combination of these groups that give it, uh, give it those properties. All right. Um, let's see. A couple others, maybe. Uh, I think we already saw those. Let's see. Oh, maybe, maybe this one here. Oh, another one of my favorites. Let's see. Oh, I like this one. <laughs> what functional group is that? It's one we haven't mentioned lately. But what is it again? Carbonyl with an oxygen and then a carbon on this side. So that's indeed a ether, aldehyde. What is it? Ester. Very good. Anybody know what this is the essence of? It's one of these uh, essential oil compounds out of a fruit. Bananas. Okay. <laughs> There's a couple of esters. It's the essence of bananas. <laughs> you can make it synthetically or you can get out of the banana. It doesn't matter. Uh, let's see. Oh, this is a good one. Speaking of aldehydes, double bond and an aldehyde. So we got aldehyde, alkene, and aromatic, all these things together. That's cinnamaldehyde. That's great. It's the essence of cinnamon. Okay. You can get that out of the tree or make it synthetically. And, uh, you get the, uh, get the idea there. All right. Let's summarize the properties, the intermolecular forces. And when we talk about forces, we're talking about, uh, the properties that hold together molecules in the uh, pure state. Okay. We'll also talk about, you know, water solubility and how they can interact with water or not interact with water, right? Hydrophobic effect. And this comes out of the properties of the structures. So everything goes back to structure, right? So what are these forces here? Well, ionic uh, is where we have charge things. And, you know, organic molecules, can be within the plus charge part of a salt or the negatively charged part of the salt. And there can be, you know, nonpolar bonds in there. And this charged state makes this, what, highly salt-like thing with electrostatic point charges. What's the uh, magnitude of that force? Well, they can be about 150 kcals, okay, which is a tremendous amount of energy holding together electrostatically oppositely charged ions, okay? And hopefully you remember that from Gen Chem. These are high melting, high boiling materials that are brittle, okay, and tend to be always solids under normal conditions. So, but they're inorganic compounds as well. These intramolecular forces that hold together these, uh, these charges like that. Uh, let's give you a little bit of a, of a, you know, a basis to compare here. Carbon hydrogen, uh, sigma bond here is worth about a hundred kcals, okay. And that's an intramolecular force, right? Holding the molecule together. And a carbon-carbon bond is about 90 kcals, okay? So we're not talking about these internal forces. We're talking about intramolecular forces between two oppositely charged uh, salt-like things there. And then we have um, uh, van der Waals. And these are induced dipole-dipole uh, interactions. They're very weak. Okay, they're typically one to two kcals. Okay. And these are nonpolar bonds. Okay, so carbon hydrogen bonds, for example. Uh, you know, one to two kcals. So if you have a large molecule with a lot of uh, nonpolar things, you can actually induce a temporary dipole moment, which will have these dispersion or van der Waals effects that are very weak. OK, but they can still affect the melting point and boiling point and things that we'll see. But generally, we've gone from the strongest force to the weakest force. <laughs> I kind of mixed up how we got these here. OK, dipole, dipole. This is where we have a permanent uh, polar covalent bond. OK, and uh, those polar covalent bonds, you have a partially positive, partially negative end. And those can line up. Those tend to be stronger 
okay? They can be two to five kcals, depending on the magnitude of that dipole moment, but uh, still pretty weak, okay? And then we have the special case here of this, which is hydrogen bonding. Uh, a hydrogen bond, it has to be a hydrogen on an alcohol or an amine. And that's where we have a very electronegative functional group that still has a hydrogen on it. And it's this the guy that can what? Hydrogen bond uh, with something else here. So we have the partially positive end the partially negative end. And that's just like a dipole-dipole interaction. But it's a special one because hydrogen's so small, and if it's on a very electronegative atom, it can be much stronger. It can be 5 to 10 kcals, okay? Hydrogen bonding. And also interactions with water tend to be these intermolecular interactions between water and the different functional groups. This kind of summarizes it up and gives you kind of a basis to compare with the different energies there. So let's look at uh, some molecules here and see what we're up against. So we've got, uh, let's see, how about this type of molecule? Hexane, well, it's just nonpolar, right? But as these bump into each other and move around, you have a big bag of electrons here, right? And that's what a molecule is. They're insulated electrons. But as they bump around, and you notice you can create these electrostatic interactions, even with a nonpolar material like a balloon, which is made out of rubber material. If you rub that balloon on your head or on the carpet, you can accentuate these uh, these temporary dipole moments that can be created. Yeah, you can discharge them. You can get a little spark. <laughs> that discharges it, but these temporary induced dipole things have to do with a partially positive end induced on one side as they collide with a partially negative side on the other. Okay, so that's van der Waals, okay, that we're talking about. They're very weak, they're temporary, and they have to be induced mechanically. If a nonpolar molecule has a large surface area, if it tends to be more linear, those can be stronger forces. If you have branching, or if it's more ball-shaped in structure, more compact, these forces are less, okay? And those tend to have lower boiling points and melting points, okay? And I'll show you specific examples uh, later. But let's see, different molecule here. Here there's a permanent dipole, okay? It's not induced. So acetone, for example, can interact with what? With itself here, matching up the partially negative end with the partially positive end, okay? And the little deltas mean pos partial charges on there, okay? What about halides? Yeah, here you have a pretty strong dipole moment, right? Stronger even than, uh, well, carbon oxygen is very strong too, certainly stronger than a carbon nitrogen. But with this type of dipole, you'd have this interaction again, partial positive side, partial negative side, being able to, to do that, okay? And then hydrogen bonding is really a, a different thing there, like we showed you. If you have an alcohol, this interaction here can be much greater, it can be 5 to 10 kcals per mole. It has to do with the directionality and how it's lined up. Being a smaller atom lets it get closer together, but this is what the partially positive end here and this is the partially negative end from the lone pair there. All right, we're almost out of time, but let me give you something to stew on here for next time. Let me give you a couple of octane materials. Here's octane, okay, eight carbons in a row. Let's see, boiling point, 125 degrees C. If that's the major component in your gasoline, you're in trouble. Your engine will knock apart. <laughs> the pistons will have all sorts of problems. You hear the rods knocking. <laughs> so we'll get into a little bit of engineering with this molecule. But let's look at this molecule. This is called isooctane. <laughs> it's highly branched. It's the same thing, C8H18 but it's got the different ordering here. We call these isomers, structural isomers of each other. 
What's the boiling point here, higher or lower than 125? This one, your engine will run perfectly. It'll hum along, all sorts of power, has an octane rating of 100. When you fill up at the gas pump, you've got the octane number. They go anywhere from 85, I think, to 92 here in Utah. This can vary depending on the state or the gas station you're at. Octane rating of 100. What's the boiling point here, higher or lower? Lower, yeah. Let's see, boiling point 99. And you might think, well, that's just a little bit lower. No, it's 25 degrees. It's going to mix quicker with oxygen. It's going to burn faster and have no rod knock, okay, which is an important thing in an engine, right? So we'll relate these properties, some things we talked about here. No branching here tend to have higher boiling points, more uh, dispersion forces. More branching here, they're more compact, weaker internal electric forces, and lower boiling points. So we'll get more into the properties next time. Very good. Sorry, I went a little bit over, but we'll see you next time. Thank you. Okay.